Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this panel on the reception of the avant-garde. So we will eventually only be two speakers today, uh, but which will give extra time for the speakers and for the questions in the audience, so don't hesitate to ask your questions. Uh, I suggest we do the first two pre presentations and then, then we do the questions after the two presentations, if that's fine with you. Uh, so to start with, we have today uh, Max Bonhomme from the Université Paris-Nanterre in France, and he will talk in he will be talking to us about the f uses and reception of photomontage in French modernist graphic design and uh, journals. Thank you to the organizers of this symposium. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, so uh, yes, I will be talking about uh, photomontage in France in the practice of uh, graphic designers. Um, so the aim of this presentation is to sort of respond to an assumption that was widely shared in, in, uh, in histories of photomontage, uh, the idea that photomontage had a lesser place within the French avant-garde, uh, especially compared to countries like Germany or the USSR. Um, but this way of putting the terms may seem somewhat chauvinistic, as if uh, I was here to uh, restore France to its rightful, rightful place in the uh, glorious history of the avant-garde. Uh, that, that's not exactly my goal here. Um, on the contrary, um, I think that in order to uh, understand photomontage in its diversity, uh, we need to look outside the discursive framework of art. So uh, I kind of uh, <laughs> disagree with the idea of reception. Sorry if uh, that's the title of the panel. I'm not exactly talking about reception, but really how photomontages were conceived from the very start outside the uh, framework of art. And instead consider uh, um, this phenomenon in the context of uh, what we call today graphic design, uh, that, that was a new professional field in the, uh, the period. And I will be showing how photomontage was used uh, uh, among those professionals of printing, of the illustrated press, advertising and political communication. So first, I, I would like to emphasize that the, um, the introduction of photomontage into the practice of French graphic designers was part of a moment of uh, radical redefinition of their practice. Um, although the word graphism uh, in French already or existed in the French language, uh, its meaning changed around 1930 to refer not to end drawing anymore, but to the various operations involved in the design of printing, printed matter. Uh, in 1928, uh, a French uh, photographer and printer called René Zuber wrote that the French language lacks a word that can be used to refer to an illustrator, an advertising or fashion designer, a wallpaper designer, engraver, poster painter, bookbinder, or typographer all at once. Well, these are all the type of activities that are encompassed in this new idea of graphism. In 1929, the journal Art et Métier Graphique published an article that was probably the first in France to use the word graphism, once again in French, uh, in the sense of graphic design. Uh, so the, the title of the article was actually uh, in the plural, uh, and this article was written by uh, someone called Pierre Macorlan. And uh, uh, the, the layout for this article uh, and the illustrations were taken care of by uh, Alexei Brodovich, who became much more famous afterwards. So this article published in the uh, leading French journal in the field um, introduced the idea of, graphis of graphism to refer to the, the multitude of visual signs uh, that uh, meet the gaze of the, uh, the inhabitant of the metropolis, so to say. So uh, illustrated posters, neon signs, or also um, a kiosk filled with uh, illustrated magazines. 
Um, so the, the modern notion of graphism or graphic design resulted from um, technical transformations that affected visual culture in the early 20th century. And in particular, uh, photo, photo mechanical printing processes that made it possible to consider the composition of text and illustrations as equal in the press. So the image uh, was to play an increasing role in communication to the point of supplanting the written word. That's an idea that was very widespread in, in uh, modernism, the idea of the visual over the text that was uh, formulated by people like Elisitsky in Russia, uh, but also, um, also by other people in, in Germany. Uh, so in, the, in, in these same years, um, uh, the typographer and critic Maximilien Vox uh, also used this, this new meaning of graphism to encompass uh, the different activities involved in the design of printed matter. Uh, like theoreticians of new typography in Germany, and most avant-garde designers actually, Volve, uh, Vox emphasize the growing importance of the image in communication, as I, as, as I just said. Um, in a hyperbolic way, he even draws a parallel between the 20th century and the Middle Ages, uh, for, uh, both periods being marked by a sort of predominance of the visual. Um, so I, I translated the, <laughs> the quote, sorry if it's not really well uh, translated in English, but he says that um, uh, the baroque but not absurd idea emerges of a world whose essential, essential reflexes are governed only by the image, back to its es essential and spontaneous barbarity, from which the latter would have almost completely disappeared, and which, like the people in the Middle Ages at the portal of Chartres, would seek in images for its profound reasons for being. And th this kind of, uh, these kinds of temporal collusions, I would say, are not uncommon in early texts on graphic design. Uh, among these, we should single out uh, Mise en Page, The Theory and Practice of Layout, a book that was published in 1931 by Tolmer, uh, an advertising, uh, a French advertising agency, with a text written by the art critic Jean Sells, who traced the origins of layout, so uh, page composition, uh, mise en page in French, uh, back to prehistoric times. And the illustrations of the book combine uh, avant-garde techniques, such as photo montage, with reproductions of inscriptions from uh, ancient times from the, the antiquity. Thus, the advent of modern graphic design was seen hyperbolically as one of the great milestones in the, uh, the evolution of humanity. <coughs> um, we, we are in an ideological context in which the effects of mechanization on, on culture were causing growing anxiety. And the, the first writings on, uh, on graphic design strongly insist on the need to organize the visual chaos that results, results from modernity. It is then considered that the, the acceleration of life, of lifestyles, require uh, more visual, more image and less text, less reading. Thus, I, I argue that the introduction of photomontage into the practice of advertising designers was part of what we could call today attention economy. So the idea that uh, attention is a rarity. Uh, and modernist graphic designers saw themselves as uh, sort of uh, engineers of visual perception Instrumental, instrumentalizing uh, the photographic fragment as a tool to capture attention in an increasingly competitive visual environment. 
Um, advertising studios played a, a central role in the dissemination of uh, new forms of montage, new forms of uh, photographic montage. Uh, the most influential of these studios was uh, undoubtedly uh, the one created by De Berni et Peignot, one of the main uh, type, foundry, type foundries in, in France. Uh, De Berni et Peignot had really a dominant position on the French market of uh, uh, type, de uh, type design and, and advertising. And they published a journal called Arrêt Métier Graphique, which I mentioned earlier. And they also created uh, an advertising agency in 1930 uh, with a photographic studio. And that's that photographic studio, that photography studio, became really one of the meeting points of the photographic avant-garde in Paris. It was directed by Maurice Tabar, who was, uh, he was a photographer who was really keen on uh, all sorts of experimental processes, such as solarization, photograms, overprinting, etc. So Tabar introduced the, the, la le, the, the latest trends in uh, avant-garde photography in this advertising studio. And he was also surrounded by young designers, uh, among which we have uh, someone like Pierre Boucher, and I'm showing here two, two works by Boucher, um, at the time, produced at the time when he was working at the, the foundry at the Bernier et Peignot. And in, his, in, his, um, in these two uh, montages, he, 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 he takes the printing industry as the the theme, the theme the, uh, of his uh, of his compositions, and you have here uh, uh, an arrangement of uh, photographic fragments and letters that show that display a clear knowledge of contemporary creations from the Bauhaus and other constructivist avant-garde. <coughs> the poster, um, whether commercial, cultural, or political occupies a prominent place among the preferred media of modernist graphic designers. In contrast to books, especially rare books, richly illustrated books, who epitomize the sort of cultural elitism, posters embodied the visual culture of urban modernity as an ephemeral object uh, intended to be consumed rapidly. The introduction of photomechanical elements in posters, uh, which was extremely rare before this period, can be interpreted as a means of uh, reviving the attention of the viewer once again uh, to differentiate themselves from uh, previous posters that looked like painting, to put it simply. Um, and Cassandre was one of the first to work in this direction as early as uh, 1928 with a poster for the Galerie Lafayette. And it was mainly in this period between 28 and 32 that Cassandre produced photo montage for uh, promotional leaflets uh, and advertising posters. And that's also a period when he was in close contact with the Ring Neue Verbe Gestalter, that's a uh, uh, German association that brought together the main representatives of uh, new typography. In 29, Cassandre uh, also joined the, the Union uh, des Artistes Modernes, uh, UAM. I'll put it this way <laughs> for the rest of the presentation. Union des Artistes Modernes, a group that uh, was relay uh, between the, inter the international constructivist avant-garde and the French uh, milieu. And it was mainly within this uh, group of the UAM that photomechanical processes made their way into the world of the illustrated poster. In addition to uh, Cassandre, uh, the, UA, the UAM uh, also exhibited uh, works by Jacques Nathan. Um, here you have an image on the, on the right, uh, that is a, which is a, an advertisement for Nathan uh, Graphic Design Studio. Um, and that was published in, in L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, 
uh, journal in we, uh, for which he was working out as a layout artist. So I put it very uh, more simply. Uh, uh, Nathan was doing the layout of this journal and he's doing his own promotion in the journal. But it's also interesting because he uses uh, photographic elements in this composition as a sort of um, manifesto of, uh, of modernity, completely in line with the, um, uh, the orientation of this architectural journal. <coughs> Other poster artists active in the UAM include Francis Bernard, who ran the Paul Marshall, Paul Martial Advertising Studio and who plays photo montage at the art of his practice. The, the poster you see here in the center is from 1933 and uh, it, it plays on uh, a scale contrast between the drone and the photographic parts. Um, so apart from some technical constraints in terms of printing that made it difficult to include large photographs in posters, uh, this type of composition could have been inspired by a previous example by Herbert Bayer, who um, uh, produced this, uh, this poster for the, the Bauhaus exhibition in Paris uh, in uh, 1930. <coughs> But even in the field of uh, graphic design, however, um, technical or stylistic devices associated with um, German and Soviet avant-garde, such as sans serif geometric fonts uh, or photomontage, were sometimes deemed suspicious for their foreign origins. Examples of constructivist posters had been exhibited in Paris as soon as 1925 at the uh, Exposition des Arts Déco. But it took at least five years for Soviet photo montage to really make its mark on French graphic design. So the, the Union des Artistes Modernes, UAM, organized annual exhibitions to which some of these practitioners uh, of photo montage in the USSR were invited. And uh, in, in 1932, Jean Carlu, a poster artist, was in charge of selecting the display of posters, uh, the poster section, uh, at this exhibition uh, that took place inside the uh, Museum of Decorative Arts in Paris. So in this very official setting, the Soviet posters selected by Carlu came uh, as a shock. Hung on a structure of simple poles painted bright red, uh, those works by Gustav Klutzis, for instance, or the Sternberg uh, brothers, revealed to the French public the potential of large format photo, photo montage, bringing with uh, the Art Deco trend that dominated French posters since the mid 1920s. <coughs> and, uh, and one of Klutzis' posters even had to be removed from the exhibition on the opening day to be replaced by an another with less expli explicit revolutionary content. So that was kind of subvers subversive really at the time. Um, and at the same exhibition, uh, Carlu uh, showed a poster he designed himself for the Geneva Conference in 32, uh, a conference for uh, the Désarmement, uh, organized by the League of Nations. Uh, so this poster uh, that was produced in collaboration with photographer André Vigneault was uh, widely distributed both in large format in the streets and as postcards. Um, however, its formal proximity to, to Soviet posters probably contributed to the distrust of the founders of the Museum of Decorative Arts who had the poster removed shortly after the opening. So there was this act of censorship that uh, provoked the indignation of the, the UAM, uh, who finally succeeded in having the poster reinstalled uh, a few days later. So the, this, this scandal surrounding uh, Carlu's poster was 
in itself very revealing of the su suspicion that hung over the practice of photomontage in France at the time, particularly because of its association with communist pro propaganda. And indeed, this suspicion was not entirely unfounded, uh, considering the importance of the, co the communist press for the, the dissemination of this, uh, this art form, or this technique. Um, the model in this respect was undoubtedly the, the AIZ, the Arbeiter Illustrierte Zeitung, um, this uh, illustrated weekly published by the uh, International Workers' Relief, uh, an organization that was part of the Communist International. Uh, and this, uh, this magazine had considerable uh, circulation in Germany, up to 300,000 copies. And it was distinguished by the, the care taken with the layout and the use of uh, photographic illustrations, as we saw this morning. And yeah, in, in it was in this magazine that Artfield, that John Artfield published uh, most of his work after 1930. So given the, the success of this uh, German weekly, the AIZ, um, the Workers International Relief decided to create, uh, to initiate a similar magazine in France. Um, so directly inspired by the AIZ formula, uh, no Regard was launched in May 1928. And as these few examples show, um, Photomontage in, uh, in Regard, in No Regard and then Regard, the name changed, uh, Photomontage was used both for uh, humorous composition, let's say, but also uh, images that call for political struggle within the vein of uh, Artfield. And some, some of uh, Artfield work was also uh, included in, uh, in the French uh, magazine. But although I, I emphasize the, the, the relationship between uh, the artistic avant-garde and the field of the illustrated press, um, we, we have to point out that uh, the, the use of photomontage in the press derived not only from, uh, not mainly from conscious avant-garde strategies. Uh, I think that most of all, or it was encouraged by the printing technique, the, the use of rotogravure that allowed for uh, composing the layout through uh, just pasting images and text uh, very freely on uh, a transparent glass plate. So every, every page was actually a photomontage in a way. In uh, the case of Regard, um, ideas for layout were sometimes directly borrowed from uh, borrowed from uh, from, Sovi from the Soviet press. Actually, uh, one double spread from 1934, illustrating uh, an article about working conditions in the Renault automobile factory, was, as you see, obviously inspired by um, the layout of uh, the USSR in construction, uh, the issue that, that uh, of just one month earlier that was designed by uh, uh, constructivist artist Nikolai Trushin. Uh, so in, in 1932, for the, the, the legislative elections in, in France, uh, the Communist Party published two uh, illustrated supplements for uh, the, the newspaper L'Humanité. These were called uh, Communists, and they were printed in rotogravure and uh, illustrated with uh, photomontages. Uh, Regard, the, the, the other publication I mentioned earlier, had ceased publi publication since 1929. So the uh, the communists sought to relaunch a weekly that could revive the success of the German AIZ. And communists, this, the, the one I'm showing you here, was a sort of prototype for a new formula of regard to be launched uh, in the next year. Uh, the first issue, so there were only two uh, two issues, but the, the first one was about the, the USSR 
and uh, the layout uh, was taken care by uh, three people, Jacques-André Boifard, Robert Montabri, and Lou Chimokov. And they're credited at the end, which is really un uncommon. Um, and this association was no coincidence since Boifard and Chimokov had founded a graphic design studio uh, in 1930, and they were specialized in uh, book covers and posters. While Boifard was already a well-known photographer among surrealist circles, Lou Chimukov was sort of a newcomer. Uh, Chimukov was actually the, the pseudonym of Louis Bonin, which shows this Russian-sounding uh, name, uh, alias, to, to show his political affinities, let's say. Um, his early work, however, was far from the concerns of Agit Prop. He was trained in decorative arts and published uh, Art Deco inspired wallpaper patterns at the end of the 20s. And at that time, he was also, he was also interested in the, the decorative potential of experimental photography, creating, for instance, uh, uh, photograms from plants that would be used for uh, decoration. And he also designed the cover of uh, uh, German, German Krull's famous portfolio Metal, that's often considered the, the manifesto of modernist photography in France. <coughs> um, unfortunately, the, the, the archives of, uh, of Regard have, have been lost, so it's difficult to trace uh, who exactly was responsible for the layout of the magazine. But we know that between 35 and 36, uh, uh, the layout and the, and the, the photo montages in regard were, were designed by someone called Robert Pontabri, who was trained as an architect, but who also had a brief career in, in graphic, as a graphic designer and poster artist in the 30s. Um, and apart from his, his work in Regard, uh, Pontabri also designed the cover of another communist publication from 37, the Almanac Ouvrier et Paysan. Uh, so that was a sort of illustrated calendar that went out every year. And you have here the, the cover of the 1937 issue uh, that we can read really at first uh, glance. It's uh, organized around the portrait of a uh, handsome, smiling young man whose face is surrounded by a dynamic arrangement of, um, of uh, lettering of various sizes and shapes. Uh, the, word, the word almanac is composed in uh, uh, mechanic-like letters, in, in French we say mécan, and is placed vertically and superimposed on the sky blue ink that covers the right hand side of the photograph. So the, the composition is also divided in two vertically, playing on a, an opposition that suggests uh, a positive-negative effect, so a reference to photography. As evidenced by a, a poster he designed for the Musée de l'Homme in 1938, um, Robert Pontabri had fully integrated the uh, the style of the of German typo photo uh, promoted at the bars by people like Molinoj. Uh, but he, he also extended this uh, this approach with a, a more varied chromatic uh, uh, range. And we also know that Pontabri uh, gravitated towards the circles of modernist graphic design in France, so around the the, the UAM the journal Arimétier Graphique, and, and the people I, were, I, I was uh, telling you about at the beginning. So to, to, to sum up uh, briefly, uh, I tried to show you to what extent uh, the uses of photomontage in France have been determined by ideological and political issues. Uh, first, I've been uh, showing you how graphic designers see their role as organizers of sensory data as a way of responding to 
what we would call an attention deficit. Uh, so the effects of shock, visual disruption, uh, permitted by photomontage, were supposed to capture the viewer's attention and, and focus, uh, focus his, his or her eye. And then I've shown how the, how the association of this technique with Soviet propaganda, or communist propaganda more broadly, also made its reception somewhat, somewhat problematic uh, among the the, the, the official uh, art world. So al although the, the cultural policy of the Popular Front around 36 um, marked, let's say, the apex of this, this form of expression in France, uh, pho photomontage was also somewhat abandoned after those years. And uh, most graphic artists, poster designers, and advertisers uh, return to illustrations that were closer to painting uh, at the end of the 30s and, and then after the war. Um, and that, that's it for me. Thank you for your attention. So up next is Lori Cole. I guess she's being connected from New York University. Okay. <laughs> is she there? Oh, hi, I see you behind me. Okay, um, and you will be presenting a paper on the display and circulation of the avant-garde abroad and uh, especially in the US. So yeah. go ahead, thank, thank you. Thank you, and I'm going to share my screen after which I will not be able to see you, so please just interrupt me if anything goes wrong. Um, so thank you so much to the symposium organizers and thank you for bearing with me virtually. I recognize how challenging this is and I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate. Um, what I'm going to present today is part of the very early stages of a book project on the interface between magazines and sites of exhibition. So thank you again for including me and I really look forward to our conversation. The cover of the 1927 Machine Age Exposition Catalog features the brightly painted curves and lines of a machine, as imagined by Fernand Leger. His painting is surrounded by the title, dates, and location of the exhibition. Presented in this way, Leger's work is not just reproduced, that is, transferred to paper, but is also transformed, now part of a new material object that is at once an exhibition catalog and also an issue of The Little Review, the small magazine whose editor, Jane Heap, had organized the show. Many of Leger's works were reproduced in The Little Review in the 1920s. The Little Review's theater number, another large-scale show wherein the magazine functioned as a catalog, included an essay by Leger, a still from his film Ballet Mécanique, and a photograph of his set design. Through the Little Review, Leger's wide-ranging multimedia work reached American audiences on paper, supplementing and extending the magazine's ex exhibition practices. These two issues of the Little Review, at once magazines and catalogs, make clear how the periodical functioned as a corollary site of exhibition, often showcasing European avant-garde art for American audiences. Many exhibitions across the Americas in the early 20th century had their primary, if not their exclusive, lives on paper, circulating to audiences through periodicals. Perhaps the best-known example is Duchamp's Fountain from 1917. Rejected by the Society of Independent Artists for its first annual exhibition, it was instead featured in a photograph taken by Alfred Stieglitz in the May 1917 issue of The Blind Man a magazine that Duchamp co-edited. Artists like Duchamp, in their role as editors, were able to control the distribution and display of their artwork, as well as rhetorically frame its reception. So here you see the contextualizing texts that were included in support of the work, as well as how the photograph positions it as an art object. In this way, a sculpture was transformed into paper in the form of a photograph and then reproduced again and circulated in print. I'm sorry, I hear the feedback loop for myself speaking. I don't know if I can avoid that. Okay. In this way, a sculpture was, oh, excuse me. 
The magazine in this case functioned as the only site of display for the object, albeit in reproduction, enabling its wide circulation and ensuring its afterlife. European art across media frequently found its way to American audiences on paper, either due to the financial constraints of shipping larger objects or through reproduction in exhibition catalogs, and especially in magazines as in the examples of broom and transition, which you see here. These were mutually reinforcing practices as some magazines complemented or served as extensions of exhibition spaces. In New York, camera work, which Alfred Stieglitz launched in 1903, worked in tandem with his gallery, 291, which he founded in 1905. Camera work published high quality photographs and reproductions of art which themselves have sometimes been pulled from the magazine and exhibited. The magazine, in turn, served as a proxy exhibition space. Stieglitz described the gallery in great detail in camera work and published installation shots, as well as reviews of 291's exhibitions, thereby allowing distant readers to feel part of the community created by the gallery. Similarly, Jane Heap, the editor of the Little Review, founded a corollary gallery and then mounted two large scale shows outside of its space for which it treated issues of the magazine as catalogs, as I mentioned. Although closely aligned genres, magazines and catalogs are infrequently collapsed into a single object. Furthermore, Heap's catalogs reproduced a curatorial process that showcased art alongside non-art objects. So today I will focus on these two shows to explore the relationship between art and its reproduction, exhibition and catalog, magazine and museum. And this is part one, there's three parts, just in case you wanna pace yourselves. Magazines played a critical role in supporting new forms of art making in the early 20th century, when there were few museums and only select gallery spaces that displayed avant-garde art in the Americas. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, both commercial and coterie publications exploded in growth, while museums were naturally much slower to emerge. So in the period before the establishment of museums of modern art in the United States, that is before MoMA was founded in 1929, the Whitney Museum of Art in 1931, and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art in 1935, Magazines were often the first spaces to promote, circulate, and display emergent forms of art, as were their corollary galleries, which were often started by editors who were themselves artists. Camera work, as I mentioned, emerged out of Stieglitz's own frustrations as a photographer. And in advocating for photography, he came to champion all forms of art. Camera work featured work by Picasso and Matisse and took special care to detail how it was reproduced in print. 291 was the first place to exhibit these artists' work in the United States. And in addition to detailing its reproduction, here again are further installation shots so that readers could get a sense of what the exhibitions looked and felt like. Stieglitz underscored the close relationship between European and American artists. For example, in the issue that he dedicated to uh, Picasso and Matisse, camera work also printed Gertrude Stein's textual portraits of the artists, at once linking the American and European work, as well as reminding us of the magazine's capacity to showcase both text and image. Such connections were facilitated by key intermediaries who traveled or lived abroad. In the case of the Little Review, the shift from magazine to gallery came later, when Jane Heap, an artist, joined as co-editor. Founded by Margaret Anderson in March 1914 in Chicago, the Little Review's motto was, making no compromise with the public taste, and it published primarily avant-garde writing. In 1917, the magazine moved from Chicago to New York, and in 1918, it began to serialize Joyce's Ulysses, for which it was put on trial for obscenity, convicted and fined in 1921. This is often what the magazine is best known for. In 1916, Heap became co-editor, updated the magazine's design and included more reproductions of art by artists like De Chirico and Schwitters, 
whose work you see here, as well as that of Hans Arp, El Lizitsky, and Laszlo Maholinaj. Sometimes it plays several works on a page, as in the case of this spread, which includes Juan Gris, Duchamp, Duchampillon, Picabia, and Leger. Such pieces were sometimes accompanied by writing by figures like Apollinaire, Breton, and Tristan Sara. And I just want to note that this translation of Apollinaire was originally made for the Society Anonyme, an organization founded by Catherine Dreyer, Man Ray, and Duchamp in 1920, which sponsored lectures, concerts, publications, and exhibitions, and shared many artists with a little review. One of Heap's aims, like that of Stieglitz and Dreyer, was to bring European avant-garde art to the attention of American audiences. She declared that the Little Review featured, quote, the foremost artists in Europe. In fact, we have unostentatiously presented all of the new systems of art to America, about 20 isms in the last few years. And what I'm showing you is an ad from the magazine that also boasts of all of the isms that it features. Indeed, as early as 1921, the magazine produced issues focused on single artists, such as its Francusi number. When Anderson moved to Paris in 1923, Heap became the Little Review's sole editor and shifted its focus even more toward visual art. On her first visit to Paris in 1923, Heap met Leger, Brancusi, and Sara, among others, whose work she would come to feature in the magazine and its gallery, which was open intermittently from 1924 to 1927. In 1925, the Little Review Gallery moved from the magazine's offices on East 11th Street to a large, unfinished space at 66 Fifth Avenue, where it remained until 1927, when it moved briefly again and then closed at the end of that year, when Heap moved to Paris. Heap showed artwork that she received for the magazine at the gallery, and the gallery, in turn, helped amplify the aims of the magazine. As Anderson writes about Heap, quote, she made the Little Review the American mouthpiece for all the new systems of art the modern world had produced, from the German Expressionists to the Russian Constructivists to the French Surrealists, where painting, sculpture, constructions, and machinery of these groups were exhibited. And this is another ad uh, that links the magazine and gallery, both through its text and through the signatures of its contributors, at once artists and writers, demonstrating the geographic range and diversity of media that it featured. The gallery functioned as, quote, an adjunct to the magazine and a gathering place for intellectuals, according to the scholar Susan Noyes Platt. The poet Hurt Crane corroborates this view in a letter he wrote to Heap in 1926, where he calls the gallery a, quote, rendezvous of talent, a galaxy of wit. In 1925, a New York gallery guide describes its exhibitions as, quote, somewhat wild shows, deliberately wild. Heap kept both the magazine and gallery running on her own with little assistance or financial support. However, she did have help for her two larger exhibitions, the International Theater Exposition of 1926 and Machine Age Exposition of 1927, wherein the magazine functioned as an exhibition catalog whose design mirrored the work on view, putting pressure on what constituted art and how it was displayed and circulated. So now I'm going to tell you about those two shows in more detail. The International Theater Exposition transposed an exhibition from Europe to New York, both through the staging of the show and the production of the catalog. On a 1925 trip to Europe, Heap met Frederick Kiesler, a visionary architect, designer, and writer who had curated the International Exhibition of New Theater Techniques in Vienna in 1924. And... Um, Here's the catalog for that exhibition as well. Heap asked Kessler to reproduce the show in New York, the bulk of which he brought with him in January 1926, and to which he added a few American designers. The International Theater Exposition featured 1,541 elements from over 100 exhibitors from a dozen countries, ranging from set designs, costumes, props, artwork, by Leger, Picasso, Tsara, Hans Richter, and Rafael Barreras. For instance, it included marionettes by the Ukrainian artist Alexandra Exter, one of which you can see advertised the exhibition itself. Kiesler's radical installation methods and the scale of the show drew extensive press coverage. One art historian calls it, quote, the most important theatrical exhibition ever mounted in America. 
Heap and Keesler had planned a catalog for the show, but because it was delayed, the winter issue of the Little Review, its, quote, theater number, served in its place. The cover image, Keesler's drawing, Optophone, the automatic theater without actors, is an example of how a publication can feature unrealized artwork, in this case, a blueprint for future action. Inside, Keesler announced, the theater is dead, and then includes 23 texts by playwrights, artists, critics, 70 photographic reproductions of costumes, set designs, film stills, and a checklist was interspersed throughout the issue published in different orientations that required the reader to swivel the page, thereby inviting interaction. Even though the issue had not originally been intended as a catalog, it had been planned as the theater number um, in conjunction with the show and mirrored its impulses in print. In the case of the 1927, oh, and here you see that here. In the case of the 1927 Machine Age Exposition, the magazine simply was the catalog. Heap had been planning the Machine Age Exposition since even before she met Kiesler. And you can see some early notes of hers on the show. It emerged from Heap's belief that, quote, the machine is the religious expression of today, and she called her spiritual synthesis of art and industry. Heap's vision was distinctly American in its optimism, but it relied on European sources. The Little Review had previously published Leger's The Aesthetics of the Machine, Enrico uh, Prampolini's The Aesthetic of the Machine, and Mechanical Introspection in Art, and had showcased work by Russian constructivists, whom he had deemed, quote, engineers of art. For the exhibition, she collaborated with groups in Belgium, Russia, Austria, France, and with the artists Duchamp, Man Ray, Charles Scheeler, Arkhipenko, and Charles Demuth, uh, many of whose work she included. Held in a large warehouse space, the Machine Age exp Exposition included 300 objects from seven countries. And these included things like light bulbs, a tractor, a coffee grinder, machine guns, a meat slicer, which were installed alongside architectural models, paintings, sculptures, and photographs. And I should note that there are no installation shots, so the magazine serves an additional function as a kind of archive documenting the exhibition. One, review, one reviewer suggested that the unfinished commercial space itself, quote, had significant form. He writes, this was the unpainted white plaster finish of walls, columns, beams, girders, and floor slabs of an unpartitioned office floor. Through these choices, the art historian Christina Wilson argues that the exhibition, quote, acted as a kind of an enormous machine itself, immersing visitors in its raw factory space and surrounding them with unusual looking objects. And the show garnered the most press of any the magazine had previously produced. Like the exhibition, the catalog's cover by Leger presents a constructivist machine, and the ensuing texts celebrate architecture and industrial design. It announces itself as a catalog, even though it includes advertisements and resembles a magazine and was circulated as a supplement to the Little Review. On stationary design for the exhibition, Heap's, Heap writes to her subscribers, quote, the Machine Age Exposition was organized by the Little Review. The catalog is by way of being a supplement to the Little Review, which has not appeared for many months. We hope you will find this catalog of interest. It is in direct line with the program of the Little Review and the Little Review Galleries. Your subscription will be covered. The catalog of the exposition does not take the place of a number. And then she writes in all caps, the Little Review is not dead. The catalog intended to supplement the absent magazine prints the exposition committee, the artist committee, and a checklist organized by country interspersed with reproductions of art and texts, might much like the theater exposition. In total, the catalog contains nine essays, 45 illustrations, and such as drawings and photographs of industrial architecture, costume design, sculptures, machines. In this way, the, the impulse to synthesize the machine with modern art was replicated in print and imbricated in an American context. The catalog, available at the show and circulated to subscribers, embodies the seamlessness of the Little Review's curatorial and editorial impulses, 
and demonstrates the capacious and iterative, iterative nature of the magazine. Magazines played a critical role in supporting new forms of art in early 20th century America, and their flexibility allowed editors like Heap to strategically select, display, and circulate art in a wide variety of formats, and to rhetorically frame their exhibitions, transforming both the curatorial process and the magazine as a medium. In the case of Heap's exhibitions, the magazines that served as catalogs were designed to resemble their objects of inquiry reimagining theater, and demonstrating the fusion of art and industry. They required viewer interaction to reorient images and checklists, and transformed an encounter with art into an intimate relationship with its reproduction on the printed page, underscoring the central role that paper played in bringing European art to the attention of American audiences. It is this feedback loop between the physical experience of art and its paper corollary that interests me, as the Little Review offered an experience of the European avant-garde both in person and on paper. While magazines like the Little Review are useful archives, as I mentioned, they are also what art historian Samuel Bibby calls, quote, active agents in the making of art historical meaning, as opposed to functioning as mere documents of the past. Magazines often prompted the formation of the kinds of institutions that they saw were lacking to support new forms of art. In this case, the Little Reviews exhibitions influenced Alfred Barr Jr., who as a professor at Wellesley, called the Little Review Gallery a place to quote, always find something interesting. And his early shows at MoMA, as its founding director, reflect the influence of Heap, as they included a display of theater art and of machine art, both in 1934. In this way, a magazine and its accompanying exhibitions catalyzed a museum. The pressure that the Little Review puts on the categories of magazine and museum come at a time when both were under contestation. The American sculptor John Storrs, writing in the Little Review, dismisses what he calls modern museums as, quote, highly efficient organizations that remind me of a visit I once played, paid to the morgue in Paris. There, in refrigerated glass, one saw those things which were once alive, laid out carefully on ice to keep them in a semblance of life. By contrast, he wants to capture that life force, and he calls on American artists to, quote, create for your public buildings and homes forms that will express that poise and simplicity that one begins to see in some of your factories, rolling mills, elevators, and bridges. A similar impulse animates Heap's machine art exposition, and much of the Little Review, whose exhibitions and publications pushed the boundaries of the magazine and museum alike, while offering a platform for artists working across media to preserve and circulate their work on paper. Thank you so much.